I think we, we'll probably wait for like some kind of a... That's fine. Yeah. really having a good time here. Uh oh. It's just like <clears throat> well, the fact that we moved out here now everyone thinks I know exactly yeah, I know. Means are... keep talking. <laughs> yes please. You're making us nervous. <laughs> Excuse me. Are you um, in touch with? Hey, Bell. Like, are you?
should let my... Good evening, Good evening. <laughs> and welcome to the 2024 Bach Institute. This is our second day of work with our fellows, and it's our first public event. Um, and really excited to kick off our current season, which is subtitled Bach's Time. Uh, we are going to be exploring repertoire that is asking questions about the passing of time, eternity, time flowing quickly, time slowing down, all sorts of things. Um, but tonight, we are going to be asking a slightly different question, which is, is Bach for everyone? And um, the impetus for hosting this conversation came from my becoming aware of our guest Nicholas Pond's series called Bach 52. And I'm in a few seconds have him explain it more. Um, but I was so excited to see that question being explored and delved into by so many wonderful musicians and thinkers and lovers of Bach. And I said, this is the conversation that we want to be having at Emmanuel and, and the kinds of conversations that I really feel the Bach Institute is invested in. So um, it just gives me such great pleasure to be able to welcome Nicholas Pond to join us. Um, before I give a formal introduction, I just want to give you some um, logistics. Um, we're going to have a panel discussion. Um, we'd love to hear your questions, but we'd like to ask you to hold them till the end of the event, um, at which point there'll be a talkback mic, so you'll be able to come and pose your questions that will be easy to hear for all of our various audiences. Um, and I'd also love to invite our fellows to um, propose their questions first. So um, I know you'll probably, all of you have lots of comments as you listen to all the things we talk about and just jot them down and, and be ready to ask. Um, so I'm Pamela Dallal, of course, the director of the Bach Institute. And my colleague, Ryan Turner, is my associate director and also the artistic director of Emmanuel Music, our host and host ensemble. Mm -hmm. But we're particularly excited to welcome our guest, Nicholas Pan, who um, <clears throat> has been described by the Boston Globe as one of the world's most remarkable singers. Uh, American tenor Nicholas Pan is increasingly recognized as an artist of distinction. With a diverse repertoire that spans nearly 500 years of music, he performs regularly with the world's leading orchestras and opera companies. An avid recitalist and passionate advocate for art song and vocal chamber music. In 2010, Pan co-founded Collaborative Arts Institute of Chicago, an organization devoted to pr promoting this underserved repertoire. He is also sought after as a curator and programmer. In addition to his work as artistic director of the CAIC, Pan is host and creator of a web series examining the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. Bach 52, and has created programs for broadcast on various radio stations. Um, Pond's programs often exam examine themes of identity, highlight unfairly rep underrepresented voices from history, and strive to underline the re relevance of music from all periods to the currents of the present day. So welcome, Nick. <laughs> So tell us a little bit more about your Bach 52 project. Sure. So it's interesting, you know, Bach's time and Bach and time. And I feel like this question arises from the times in which we live. It's, you know, always interesting to question the enduring relevance of a great art and artist as time passes. And Bach seems to stick with us for one reason or another. And we're living in this moment right now where we're asking a lot of questions about a lot of these sort of canon artists and composers and creators. And Bach, I feel like really, it's interesting. A lot of people think that there is a sort of before Bach in music and a, an after Bach. Hmm. And sort of everything is kind of in relation to Bach or a lot of what we think of in Western music is in relation to Bach. And 
So I sort of feel like by asking this question of Bach, we're sort of asking this question of classical music as a whole, because you're kind of asking it of the core foundation of Western classical music. Uh, the question was actually first asked of me when I was touring with uh, the Weimar Bach Academy and Helmut Rilling. We were doing work uh, workshops of Bach cantatas in Weimar where we would rehearse them and work with Maestro Rilling on the cantatas and, you know, singers and instrumentalists from something like 35 different countries came to Weimar to work on these cantatas with Helmut. And we would sort of work on them for a couple weeks, do these lecture recitals where he would break things down and talk about the theology and talk about the music for audiences. And then we would go to various churches that Bach worked at in the region, ending in either Eisenach or Leipzig, at either the church he was baptized in or the church where he's buried for the final concert. And one of these years, there was a, I think Deutsche Welle, one of the German TV things, was doing the documentary on Helmut and they were focused on this idea that you know, these, this academy where, that featured people from so many different nations and backgrounds were coming to study the music of Bach. And so they were asking all of us questions and interviewing us. And one of the first questions they asked me was, do you think the music of Bach is for everyone? And I immediately answered, well, yes, of course. And as those words were coming out of my mouth, I thought, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought immediately of those, those album covers of the Bach pilgrimage from the John Elliott Gardner recordings of the cantatas and how those are an interesting choice for you know, album covers for Bach cantatas. I mean, they feature these sort of National Geographic portraits of indigenous peoples from all over the world. And I just found myself asking this question, is that actually true? And so it's stuck with me. I mean, I think that was almost 10 years ago that question was asked of me, and it's been sticking with me ever since. And so, I don't know, we, we all found ourselves with a lot of time on our hands recently <laughs> during the pandemic lockdown. And uh, for me, that was a time where I was able to kind of be creative. And I thought, and also we were in the midst of this, you know, at least in the United States, this racial reckoning with the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and within the classical music world and in the opera world, people were asking these questions about all of our canon composers and, you know, questioning, are these people colonialists? Are they racist? Are they, you know, you name it. And it occurred to me, I kept coming back to that question from the interview. And so I thought it would be so interesting to kind of create a series that asks this question. And so I'm, the series is gonna feature 52 episodes because sort of inspired by Bach's annual pilgrimage through the church year, you know, he has three year long, what, three years worth of cantatas that survived. So I kind of wanted to do something that was cyclical or that would at least give me a year's worth of things and there are 52 weeks in a year, so 52. And uh, each episode kind of asks this question of, people of various backgrounds and people with various relationships to Bach and pairs those interviews with one of the tenor arias from the church cantatas each week. And part of the reason is A, I just want to sing them and they're beautiful <laughs> arias, but also B, those two things. Um, one, it's in these cantatas where we find Bach being his most experimental, I think. He's really playing around with a lot of styles from various places and kind of honing his compositional skill in many ways. There's a sort of exercise element of it. And then also, so we get to see him sort of exploring himself, but then also, you know, it's, it, it, the church cantatas, I don't know, they get to this core question of like, is it actually for everyone? Because we're dealing with these extremely dogmatic Lutheran texts that sometimes just don't make any sense to us in the modern day. <laughs> um, or at least many of us, I shouldn't say all of us. So anyway, that's, that's, that's the project. And um, I'm so excited to be here. I've been a fan of manual music forever. And uh, it's really excited to be a part of this Bach Institute and to be able to kind of take this question into like a live into the, into the wild, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> and the wild, it might be. Yeah, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
as we start to hold this question up and, and turn it around and imagine all the different facets, um, let's start with audiences, people who, who listen to music and, and draw something from the art of music, just as a general art, not even classical music. Um, you know, what can we say? Is, is Bach, is there something in Bach that can speak to anyone from any background that likes to listen to music? Or was it for me? <laughs> <laughs> Expecting this, you know, uh, dynamic conversation and you're yes. all sitting here going, hmm. <laughs> Most mornings of the week, I drive my son to school. My son is 14 years old, and he calls what I do caveman music. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a conversation I have with him many mornings, because he'll often ask me, well, Dad, why couldn't you have done something normal, is what he often asks me. <laughs> why, why this music? You know? And so this is a kid that really doesn't have any interest in classical music, although could, um, but he likes to talk and likes to philosophize and likes to figure out why people like certain things. So we talk about this a lot. And then one of the things I talk to him about is that I feel like for Bach, there are so many different points of entry. Um, for some, it's you know the, the sort of mathematical problem that it is, the puzzle that's interesting. Some it's just the intellectual brilliance of the music. Some of it's the, I mean, you listen to a Goldberg variations and you can't think, help but think about the soaring melodies. I mean, and I try to engage him in that way. And so one of the things that I often do with him is I play other arrangements of Bach hmm. um, that aren't classical, or aren't what we would think of what, for example, Emmanuel music is steeped in. And sometimes I can get him hooked on Bach in that way. So, is the question of is it for everyone? I think the more the better question is can it be for everyone? <laughs> and I think the answer is yes. Um, I don't think it's easy though. I I think there's a couple of different ways to pose the question. You know, we <laughs> we know when we you know throw this question around, and I I, I absolutely owe the forming the framing of the question to Nick, because, you know. I owe it to the German journalists. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is, it is that question. So is there something in, in what Bach is offering to the world, or I suppose we could say in past tense, offered to the world, that can penetrate somebody's psyche at the right moment and just say, ah, right? I mean, I. One, one image I have is Yo-Yo Ma with his cello sitting on the wall in um, Calcutta or one of these other, I remember he, he went out there and, and was just playing for people, not expecting anyone to some, come and gather necessarily, but just sort of sending the music out into the world in such a generous and open way. And I think that Obviously, not every single person walking by him is going to stop, but there's, there's a sense that the music can just simply say, I'm here, take a moment, maybe slow down, right? I think all music has that ability to put us in a different mental state, whether it's to calm us or perhaps to unlock something. And that's not the exclusive um, prerogative of Bach, but I think that the content of Bach, whether it is just an achingly beautiful melody or the way that he walks us through something harmonically sort of so that the instincts of most people who have any affinity for music, and I'm not talking um, education in music. You don't need to know what a harmonic sequence is or hmm. what the proper resolution of a chord is. But we seem, as, as humans, to sort of respond to that sense of 
something's creating tension and then getting resolved, right? Um, and I think that there's something about the way that much of Bach's music does that, that people go, okay, I felt that. <laughs> that was nice, right? Um, something happened. Um, so I think if we look at that vein, one could make an argument that there is this thing in Bach that has the ability to speak to any human. That's, that's a, it, we're not having a debate here. We're not trying to pick <laughs> sides. But, but I could put that down as the pillar of, this would be the, the most positive of all the responses. Yes, Bach has that in him and in what he can say that can address a person along the way. At some point, some, some detail, some thread of his music, maybe not sit down and listen to an entire piece. So there's that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting. I, I, one of the things that I find fascinating about asking this question is that, in a sense, this music was created for everybody. It served a communal purpose. It's evangelical in nature. It's meant to do the things that you're describing in terms of like grab your attention and grab your heartstrings in order to win you over to a side or to impart some sort of lesson to you about the week's Bible reading or whatnot. And it's a place for, I mean, the chorales and the passions, you know, like these are these moments where like they're really supposed to be communal music making in a way. And so it's one thing to say that. And then, of course, the historian is also going to say, <laughs> He did intend it for everybody in Leipzig, or he intended it for everybody in Weimar and that entirely white German population there. Mm -hmm. So, and Lutheran. I mean, we're not even talking Jews in Leipzig and, and some, some of the other cities in which he worked where you couldn't be there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's an interesting dichotomy, and it's one of these things where, in asking the question, something that fascinates me about it is that we're forced, in a way, to hold multiple truths at the same time, which I think is important for us. It's an important exercise for us <laughs> as a society. I think, and then as, you're as both of you are talking, there are things that come up for me in terms of like other people's interpretations of Bach. Mm -hmm. Like there is, you know, I, whether people know it or not, if you pull someone on the street, they're gonna know a piece by Bach, right? I mean, at least, like, we don't have Halloween without, what is it, the D minor Toccata? Like, oh. <laughs> you know, like, and that's unadulterated. Like, no one's doing that with the swingle singers or doing it on a tuba. Like, you know, we're used to hearing that on the organ as it was written and as it was intended, and like, it is popular music. Mm -hmm. You also have artists, like, wide-ranging as, like, Nina Simone, the swingle singers, you know, whoever, incorporating these aspects of Bach into their own music. So there is this kind of like popular sort of collective consciousness aspect of it now that he's sort of seeped into that. And then the other thing, you're talking about like Yo-Yo Ma. And the thing that pops up for me about that is you have like, I don't know how many symphony orchestras trying to figure out how to get people to buy a ticket <laughs> and come to the concert. And yet Yo-Yo Ma, played the box suites and sold out the Hollywood Bowl twice. Like, that's 20, 30,000 seats sold because of the cello suites. Two people were on stage that day, Yo-Yo Ma and Bach. Like, <laughs> so, you know, in terms of, like, there's an appeal. Mm -hmm. There's this, there is an intention of some sort about it being for everyone. And then there's this malleability of it where, I mean, you described it yesterday as resilience. It is, it is extremely <laughs> resilient music in the sense that it can take a lot of, it can, I mean, it's playable on just about any instrument. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there are definitely composers that cannot survive that, that, that their music dissolves oh, yeah. when it gets translated into some other uh, context or some other instrumentation um, subjected to different rhythmicizations, right? Um, changing um, Yezu Joy of Man's Desiring into, you know, something that has a backbeat and even has a different metrical structure, mm -hmm. right? Get rid of the triplets, you know. Um, <laughs> somehow that, that music can survive that. I don't, I'm not going to sit here and argue that it's just as good. Um, <laughs> but 
but the, that is, I think, a fascinating aspect of this question is that something about what is essential to that music survives. And because it survives, it can then work its magic to an audience that is going to respond first to this, this sort of familiarity of, of the rhythmic beat and then go, but I like this piece because I also like the tune, and the tune happens to be written by Bach. Um, coming back for a, a moment to thinking of Bach that we're not altering, but just taking at his word, in other words, complete works of his performed as, as they're meant to be performed, so fully orchestrated in the German language, multi-movement, works, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these have always been issues that I think um, promoters, et cetera, worry about. You know, we live in a city, Boston, that has a, a healthy and very well-educated audiences of, of classical music. People don't really bat an eye if the performers are singing in a foreign language. But performing music in German can be a, a very strong barrier to many people who might otherwise want to come and hear what's happening. Um, another aspect that uh, Bach he was criticized for even his, in his own day was the complexity of the music, the, the density of the counterpoint. But even if it's not contrapuntal, there's still so many things going on. There's like, you know, passing dissonances and um, elaborate phrases that, that contain multiple melodies at the same time um, can your average whoever or the everyone that we're talking to, can, can they approach something with that kind of complexity and find something in it that speaks to them? Um, I have just a couple things, notes here. Another, another aspect, again, I'm playing now devil's, devil's advocate, the seriousness of Bach's music, right? I mean, we sort of have this sense that he didn't have a lot of fun, you know? <laughs> he was always trying to talk about the most serious things, right? Um, and, and I think in our culture, in, in many strands of our culture, music has a very different role to play. Music creates a framework, it creates a background, it, it, um, it sort of lubricates a, a social situation. Um, I don't really imagine box music functioning very well in any of those three <laughs> contexts, right? It's not good background music. No. Um, and, and then just length, right? The, the sort of attention span that you need to follow the argument, the, the musical journey to its end, um, that's a very common thing we say about our modern culture is that attention spans are just, you know, shortening by the decade or even the half decade. So um, how can music that unfolds on, over such a long time, and, and I'm even thinking at the level of a phrase. We're not talking, you know, Wagnerian opera length, although some of his pieces get long, but I'm thinking even just sort of f sticking with a, a single harmonic sequence also takes a fair amount of attention span. And is that something that can only appeal to you if you've been trained to understand it? So I would like to say no. I, I feel that if somebody is willing to sit with an open mind and they allow the music to just tap into something that's very, very internal, that they can follow what's going on in the harmonies without under, being able to explain it, just allowing it to touch them emotionally. But I think um, it's hard to get to that point where you can run that experiment. I, I wonder how much of that is the music itself and how much of that is also like what we put on the music. Mm. You know, there is this, there can be this veneer of sort of erudite elitism that, that is associated with his music. And 
I think that can be really off-putting to people, but I don't know that that necessarily is his mm -hmm. music at the end of the day. I mean, it certainly invites that kind of examination, which yeah. is fantastic. I mean, great. We have something to sink our teeth into. That's why we're all here right now like <laughs> to do that. That's wonderful. That's why many of us have devoted our lives to studying and performing this music. And like, you know, it's, it's why somebody like Yo-Yo Ma, going back to Yo-Yo, like, can do that 30 years ago, record all of them, and then come back to it record the same pieces and they're completely different. You know, there's like something new in there for mm -hmm. us to continue to discover, which is I think the, that's the trademark of the greatest art, something that grows with us and we grow with it. But it's, um, I don't know, some, I, how much of that is also like this thing we put on, and it's, the compl speaking to the complexity, it's interesting, some of the people I've interviewed in Bach 52 have said, yeah, it's too complex and I don't think that it's really for many people. Other people have said, because of its complexity and the fact that we live in the age of the algorithm <laughs> is the thing that makes them fascinated by it. Mm. So it's, I don't know, it's as, an, as, you know, as the interviewer hearing all these answers, <laughs> it's interesting hearing a variety of opinions. You know, one of the things that always fascinated me about Bach is, and you hit on this to some degree when you talked about, I think it was you that said, talked about time and Bach, and that, and is it background music? I mean, when Bach was writing cantatas, he had a captive audience, and he was sort of emancipated from the box office, shall we say. Everything, that his, he was, had a musical vehicle, as it were, where he could explore many things, and he had a captive audience of one would guess believers, maybe not, but they were there because that's where you, in 18th century Saxon, that's where you went on, on Sundays. Um, later in his career, when he had sort of grown weary of the, the slog of writing cycles of cantatas and had his own um, contentious relationship with the church and he turned his efforts toward the, Col the Collegium Musicum, this is in the late 1720s, and was doing all this stuff for Zimmermann's Coffee House. And, just before we started this talk, we were talking about one of his secular cantatas, Phoebus and Pan. Um, and many of these secular cantatas, he was taking popular forms of the day, the popular dance forms, and in the gallant style. And as Bach would do is he could write in this, quote, popular style, but with tremendous brilliance, complexity, and there was a sort of extra musical layer that perhaps the common I don't want to say common, the, the casual listener might not catch, but would, be appeal, would find the gallant style and the melodies appealing. So I think one of the things, I talk about the points of entry, that is an example, I think, how I can imagine how Bach, at least in his time, was um, being able to pull in someone who wasn't musically erudite, but also at the same time was able to catch somebody who was musical erudite and, and meet them at their level of musical complexity. Um, I want to take one more pass around this, this question of his audience or audiences in general before we transition to a different facet. I'm thinking now about the other thing. We were talking, we, I think it's great that all three of us have stuck even though we're, we're referring mostly to the vocal music that all three of us, of course, know best. But we've been talking a lot about musical things, you know, complexity, density, um, harmonic rhythms, things like that. Um, but the message. And um, this touches a little bit on these questions of Lutheran faith and um, captive audiences, um, the fact that, that the cantatas in particular are literally designed to either convert or bolster a particular belief system, right? So, you know, if you, if you pull that out and you say, well, this is what the piece is for, this is what it was composed for, I, I think it's pretty easy for most people to say, well, that's not me, you know, he's not speaking to me. I, I, I have no relationship to this faith tradition. I don't, I don't want to be converted or, or persuaded, and I certainly don't need to be bolstered, right? Um, 
And, and, and it is fascinating because so many people who are just absolutely devoted and passionate about Bach are not part of those faith traditions and will speak very strongly about the fact that I don't, I don't agree with him or I don't, I'm, not, I'm not doing the thing that the music is telling me to do. So what's going on? What's wrong with all of us? Why are we so hungry for this music? And I, I think the answer for me and for Emmanuel musicians in general is that it feels like he's really pulling out questions about the human condition. And when you start to think about music that's talking about the things that matter the very most to us as mortal creatures, right? And of course, mortality touches on this whole idea of religion, faith, afterlife, death, all that stuff. But even if you don't believe any of that, I hope there's no one listening to this who doesn't believe that mortality is a thing, right? <laughs> We're all dealing with that as, as living beings. And to me, that really is the heart of what I find endlessly fascinating, unbelievably moving, and humblingly instructive is how he's continually telling us how difficult it is to engage with the things that are hard for us and how we may aspire to be better people, better, better with our neighbors, better with our internal consciences um, and continually trying to direct us to a state where perhaps those things will feel more natural, more organic. Um, I have to say to me, that's the heart of, it's this where I feel he speaks to everyone. You know, can we, can we show audiences that you want to come listen to this because he's going to tell you something about yourself that maybe you've always known but you haven't wanted to face. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think um, all that other stuff is sort of on the way to this, the message. I think it really is speaking to all of us because he's talking about this thing that none of us can escape because we live in, in bodies and we age, and we, we must die. Gosh, I wish I had had you a few months ago. I was teaching a class at Boston Conservatory, and we was focused on oratorial repertoire, and one of the students raised their hand and was like, I don't believe any of this. <laughs> so what do I do with that? Right. <laughs> and I was like, well, don't sing it. Like, I, <laughs> I, just, I mean, I was, that was flip. But, uh, it's, it was a good question that that student brought up because yeah. it's like, you know, it's uh, especially when you're trying to teach it too, it's like you have to kind of, um, I don't know, that's a very, faith is a very personal thing. And I think this is why, like what you're touching on for me is what draws me to music. I mm -hmm. mean, and I think Bach is really spectacular at this, um, is that Music has this wonderful power to kind of bring us together and to, to get us to, to focus on the things that we have in common rather than the things that make us different from each other. And maybe appreciate those differences in that way because we can see the bridges that connect us. And I think he's great with that. It's interesting though, I think that's also why he's been unpopular at times in history. I mean, if you think about right at the end of his life, and sort of the, the ushering in of the enlightenment and everybody's like, yay, easy answers. And it's kind of like, Bach has not easy answers. Mm. Like it never resolves. You know, I mean, how many times in rehearsals today were people like, oh my God, we're at finally at a final cadence and we have no idea how to coordinate that because we've been going for 115 measures with no break. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's the nature of his music. And I think it's, it's he forces us to sit with the messiness and the complexity of what it is to be human, like you say. And in a way, he's, I mean, he's very anti-enlightenment in that way, and he's very regressive in a, in, a, in a sense. And again, coming back to time and our time, maybe that's why we find him compelling, because we live in an extraordinarily messy time with 
a lot of complexity and where we're all thinking about mortality in different ways. Sometimes it's because life is so long for some certain generations, and other times it's like we don't know how long it's going to be because of the way the world is changing and the way the climate is changing. And, you oh. know, so, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, in, I mean, not to be too heavy, but I think that's one of the reasons why maybe now is a great time for Bach as opposed to, you know, the early 80s. <laughs> <laughs> when we all fell in love with Bach. Yeah, right, sure. exactly. <laughs> um, if, if, you, if I may, let's, let's turn the question in a slightly different direction. So instead of asking, is Bach for everyone to appreciate, what about to perform? <laughs> Before we do that, can we go back to this previous question? Because sure. there's something I wanted okay. to say about it. As you were talking about this, so many times I've met people who will sit in the back of the church and listen to a cantata. They'll sneak in right before the cantata happens at 11. They'll listen to it, and they sneak out before anybody catches them in church. <laughs> <laughs> um, and some of them are on our board. <laughs> And so I've had the opportunity to talk to them and say, ah, caught you at church. <laughs> um, but one particular board member said to me once, I, I, I remember I saw her right before the cantata, and she was just standing there without a bulletin or anything. And I said to this board member, I handed her a, a bulletin where the translation was. And she says, no, that gets in the way. And afterwards, I said, what do you mean? She said, well, that's, box music sounds to me what I, th I believe devotion to a perfect ideal sounds like. And the text gets in the way of that. Mm. The text is what I can believe if I don't have to see the text. Um, another thing that our rector, Pamela Wernz, which I've often thought this, and as often as the case with Pamela Wernz, she puts it far more eloquently than I was able to sort of formalize my emotions, was that in a sermon recently, she told the congregation in preparation for listening to a particular cantata that was rather heavy-handed in the Lutheranism. And she said, you know, if the mention of the deity or gottes is a stumbling block for you, I encourage you to substitute it with the word love. And I think that gets to the heart of what the sense of humanity about, you talked about neighborly, how can we be kind to one another? Yeah, the, I mean, I was raised Lutheran. I'm a person of faith. And I'm also a person of incredible disbelief. And the texts are a stumbling block for me. And that, in my mind, was really changed things a lot. And when you look at these texts, and I know we're just talking about the sacred music of Bach right now. There's a lot more to say about the secular stuff. If you can make those substitutions, I often think about an actor on stage when they have to engage in a romantic scene with someone with whom they have no interest, or maybe even disdain. <laughs> and the actors use substitution. Yes, the non-literal substitute. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's what, that is a way to get to the heart of Bach for everyone. It, this will segue yeah. to your performer thing, but it's interesting <clears throat> that, like, the, that, that moment <laughs> when I was like having the, album covers flash from my head and think like, is that appropriation? And is it really for everyone? And immediately I thought to myself, the reason I answered immediately, yes, of course it's for everyone is because I grew up playing the violin. And so my first experience mm. with Bach was as a violinist. I remember, you know, I did Suzuki, you hit book four, you, do, you take on the second violin part of the Bach double. Book five, you take the first violin part. And I remember hearing that for the first time and thinking like, this is amazing stuff. Before that, I was not interested in music, not interested in the violin. The Bach double concerto was the thing that did it for me. I don't know why. Thank you. <laughs> um, and it was, the, it was the first time I, like as a child, I was like, there's a goal that I want to work towards. I mean, it provided me with so much direction in my life, like A, working towards the concerto, but then also B, like, I want to be a musician. And so, but then I was thinking, like, I said, like, that came from that childhood, like, relationship with Bach. But, you know, I was answering this question as a singing, you know, arias at, <laughs> in a cantata workshop, and I thought, oh, no. And in a way, the language, going, stemming from your first point, like, the language in America 
in a way, is a, it's, it's, it's the thing that like your, 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 your parishioner said, where the language becomes an impediment. And so not knowing it and not being like, you know, dealing with it in a foreign language actually gives us the remove to make it accessible in a way as mm -hmm. listeners. As a performer, that changes completely because all of us have to become so familiar <laughs> with the text because otherwise we don't know what we're, why we're doing it. Right. So, I mean, you're about to ask though, like as perform can any performer perform it? Well, I, I, I think this aspect of this question is so very, very different from what we were just discussing. It's, it's a question of what's legitimate? Who has the authentic right to play or sing this music. And of course that question and the answer to that question has varied over time, right? Um, you know, it can be anything from you must be German in, in order to really understand this music, to, to embody this music, you know, you, you're inauthentic, you come from England, you know, <laughs> something, something as parochial as another European country, right? Um, but I think that there's, there's a, a broad version of this question, which is the, the question of, you know, what instruments can Bach be played on? That comes to this sort of reimagining, rearranging of, of Bach, Bach on the accordion, Bach on the steel drum, Bach on, you know, different, instruments from very, very different traditions. And as we've said already, it, the music's still there. It still, it transcends this, you know. So um, that aspect of Bach sort of still working, still being for everyone is great. But in the, in the more narrow context, the context of professional careers in performing Bach, I think, um, that can be kind of fraught. You know, um, last year we had a panel discussion on why does Emmanuel play Bach on modern instruments? What's wrong with them? <laughs> you know, uh, because the, the sense in current day is that the only authentic way to play Bach is to play on period instruments that are imitations, are, are, are you know, reconstructions of instruments as well as we know of his time. Um, Notice all those qualifications. <laughs> That's a lot of guesswork um, there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that, that we start with a, you know, who gets to walk in the door and say, you know, I want to try this. Here's the instrument I'm holding. Can I do it? Right? Um, and then the sort of the discipline, the, the years of training and study as a, as a young student violinist, you couldn't just instantly start playing the Bach double concerto. You knew you had a goal and you had to practice and you had right. to sort of delay your gratification. I mean, this is, this is challenging. And anyone that has ever tried to do anything with Bach, the first thing they'll say is it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Everything about Bach, to execute it, to do it, it's hard. And so there's skill, there's a specialized skill, there are several different kinds of specialized skills. That I think limits that, I think that would almost be an, an automatic no, it's not for everyone because you have to train yourself, you have to be trained, right? But I'm driving at something else tonight which is a question of a sound. The Bach sound. <laughs> hmm. You know, because I, I, I feel more and more that as I teach young musicians and you know, give them the skills that I think they need and, and encourage them to dream of potential careers and potential repertoires that they can engage, um, there's this sense that I have to have the right sound. You know, am I the right sound? Teach me to make the right sound. And that disturbs me greatly. Yeah. Because I do not believe that that is the most important or even maybe on the table as one of the skills that's needed, right? Um, because the skills that are needed, first of all, control over your instrument, facility. And if you have all those things, what you need most of all is 
an imagination and a courage to make the music tell you new ideas about how to execute it. If you can do those things, you could have any, any sound, right? I think this gets to why though Bach works in so many, is so resilient. It works mm -hmm. in so many different contexts with so many different instruments. I mean, because, you know, it is challenging, but at the same time, Suzuki Book One, like the, one of the first things you play is a Bach piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're like any instrument, most instruments are playing some version of Anna Magdalena something or other. And it's a key educational tool from the get-go. Like we're not talking you need to wait until you're in book four, Suzuki. Like you've encountered Bach well before that in the Suzuki method, for instance. And so I think that should be encouraging in terms of like there's an entry point for everyone with this music as a performer. The challenge also that invites, like it's beca because it's so challenging, it's the thing that like that's why, again, I come back to this yo-yo at Ma example. It's mm -hmm. like, He's playing the same pieces, but they're completely different, and he's finding new things in them all the time. And I'm sure that has led, I don't want to speak for him because I don't know him, but you know, I'm sure, I assume it's led to personal self-discovery as well. And I think in the case of that, in that case, like you are finding your own sound with it. And really, I think that that's key. You know, it's this music, and this I get, it gets to the sort of elite erudite you know, veneer that it has, is that we th people think it's supposed to go a certain way. But it's, I think I said this to you yesterday, it's like Italian cooking. Like, you will go to Bologna and they will tell you that some sauce is made with garlic and then you'll go to Florence and you'll say the same sauce is never garlic over my dead body. And both people are right. And both people are authentic. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this music is very much that way. And it's, it's interesting because you know, I'm constantly working with very different groups from modern instruments to period instruments with all sorts of conductors with all sorts of opinions. Everybody has one as the quote goes. Um, and you, some people get really bent out of shape about some of these decisions people are making. And I always think to myself, let's just try it this way this week because next month I'll have an opportunity to do whatever, you know, something else. <laughs> like, it's, there's being rigid about it, it's, it's um, Again, it works. That's part of its resilience. Uh, I was speaking with Jeremy Dank on one of my Bach 52 interviews, and he said, you know, I'm still trying to find the right tempo for a particular thing, and I think it was the English suite. You know, he was like, it can be done in so many, or no, it was one of the inventions. It can be done in so many different tempi, and you know, if you do it this way, it's ponderous, and it's, it, it's deep, and if you do it this way, it's, you know, it's the same music, and it's equally compelling, but it sounds vivacious and flirty. Mm -hmm. and, so, I, I mean, I think that's part of the beauty of this music. I think that's part of why I keep personally coming down on this answer, the side of yes, it's for everyone, because it, it invites you to find your voice. And as a singer, that is a really disturbing thing. And I think, <laughs> I think as singer, I mean, the singers in this room, I think, can relate to this on some level. Like, we're all told what your sound is and what your sound is appropriate for. And people, the industry is gonna wanna put you in a box right quick and, you know, partly because people are trying to sell things. Yes. <laughs> and it's very easy to sell something that's like clearly packaged. But, you know, all sorts of singers have sung this music with all sorts of voices in very compelling ways. And I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like listening to, you know, Peter Pierce and Geda and Elizabeth Schwarzkopf and Christa Ludwig sing the St. Matthew Passion and Fischer Dieskau sing the St. Matthew Passion is any less compelling than listening to Anthony Rolf Johnson and Anselie von Otter and Nancy Argenta and whoever on the John Elliott Gardner recordings, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or any of these wonderful people here at Emmanuel. I mean, it's, it's, if we can, as artists, learn to think that way, it's so freeing and empowering which that's what so much of this moment in our time is about, is finding your power and finding your mm -hmm. voice. Yeah. I, well, <laughs> <laughs> listen, I agree with you all 100%, and I think that's one of the uh, things that I'm a, a, a recipient and beneficiary of, which was a sort of ethos that our founder, Craig Smith, passed down to me, that there wasn't 
there wasn't the right voice or the right stylistic approach to Bach. There was, the, the one that's right is the one that's authentic and real. And that is steeped in, in, in the text, in the material, and that is earnestly about the music. Um, that's when I think you find, that's when I think you find more Bach than when you're trying to come across with a quote Bach sound. And as it relates to the, uh, the hardware one plays with, <laughs> um, I did a lot when I was singing, most of my work was with period orchestras. And I admit at the time, I thought that was, that's the way to do it, why would, you know. And at the same time, I was singing at a manual at 440 with singers who had very different voices than mine and they came in all shapes and sizes of voices. And I remember always feeling this sense of, well, wait a second, that just worked really well, but that's not what I'm doing in other parts of my musical life. And I'm sure you probably all the time. engage in this sort of battle with yourself all the time, right? Um, and more and more I've come to believe, I mean, I think one of the, the Bach Institute is, a, is an example. I mean, all of our modern players here that wouldn't encounter this music if it was limited to just the period instruments. Um, one incredibly memorable, I don't want to say profound, but memorable experience of my college years was going to a bluegrass concert. I grew up in Texas and going to Bella Fleck and the Fleck Tones, if anyone's ever heard of them. <laughs> yes. And I have this incredible moment sitting in the audience with a bunch of my friends that were not musicians and we probably had had a little too much to drink. And Bella Fleck all of a sudden takes about 10 steps forward, the stage goes dark, and there's one spotlight on Bella Fleck. And he starts on his banjo playing the G major cello suite. <laughs> I would say 95% of the people in that audience probably didn't know what that was, but every single person in there was moved by it. And I have to admit, I had this, like, I felt incredibly proud when I leaned over to my buddy. I was like, that was Bach. <laughs> 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 um, but that was a moment where I would say, yes, Bach is for everyone. They didn't know it, but it is. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you know, Chris Teeley, the mandolin player that plays Bach so beautifully, I've heard it on marimba. I mean, I think Nick and I were talking yesterday, and he had a chuckle about me calling Bach resilient. <laughs> and that may seem a little industrial of a term, but it is true. I mean, when you think about, you know, as singers, too, we've done a number of performances of major Bach works that are outrageously challenging with community choruses. And at the end, it's still Bach. <laughs> yeah. They may struggle with it. There may be wrong notes. It may not be what we would consider to be stylistically appropriate or elegant. But at the end of it, that audience heard Bach and was probably moved by Bach, and it's still Bach. So I think that there's a, it's more than roadworthy. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, for me, that is obviously one of our missions at the Bach Institute is, is to keep saying, let's throw the doors open. <clears throat> let's, let's find people who, who, who seem to have something to say on their instruments and and bring them in and say, let's find how to do that on Bach, and let's see what Bach is going to teach us. Um, the type of performer I think that doesn't perform Bach successfully is the type of performer that's thinking a lot about how am I coming across? You know, mm -hmm. do people are they admiring me? You know, <laughs> how was that high note? <laughs> Wasn't it great? <laughs> you know? um, that that is a that's a huge barrier to letting the composer tell you what he needs you to do, right? I mean, he's, he's the ultimate in humbling. <laughs> he's, he's going mm. to say, yeah, <laughs> you, you think you know what you're doing. Now, hey, I'm gonna try to do this now. <laughs> um, but it feels often, if you can open yourself up and say, yeah, you know what? I think I'm gonna crash and burn on this. I think this is not gonna go well, but I'm going to make myself vulnerable. I'm going to allow something to not, I'm going to allow myself to crack. I'm going to allow um, myself to run out of breath, right? The whole breathing thing. I'm going <laughs> to get buried in the texture because my voice isn't powerful enough to sing over the instruments. Maybe that fragility is what's needed. Maybe that's 
exactly what in that moment in the music, he needs the singer to sound vulnerable. He needs the singer to sound fragile because he's trying to make a wider point. Um, I, I have a thesis that I love to use in my coaching, which is that, that I think Bach is manipulating the difficulty of the music in order to reach the listener so that they're engaged in the process. You know, that, that if the violinist is playing triple stops and, and amazing string crossings, it shouldn't be so easy that it just feels like, oh, they're just tossing it off. It's like the, the, the sweat, the physical effort is, is, audiences are on the edge of the, their seat because it's such an amazing feat. And I think it, that that's always feels like what he's trying to do is, is, is reaching across the fourth wall and grabbing your heart simply by the effort that the performer is putting in. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is it's very difficult music, but it doesn't have to be flawlessly executed in order to be moving and to be great performances. So um, I, I, perhaps we've covered that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's funny. I, I find with his music, I have a really, like, in, just in terms of working with other people, while I do, like, say, like, yes, we can do it different ways, different weeks. Um, I find when people show up not prepared with his music in a professional situation, I'm way more forgiving of other people's music than I am with his. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is. I think it's something inside me that's like, it's, a, it's like this deep respect for like what he has, you know, taught me, like, and like the level of commitment that is required. I mean, it really requires your whole being yeah. to do it well, which is part of what makes it so challenging and is part of what I find makes it so compelling. But it's really interesting when, um, and it, it sort of speaks to like, oh, my high note sounds great or whatever. Like that, <laughs> that kind of vanity, there's no room for that in this music. And I do think that that stems from the faith based aspect of it, not just like the religiosity of like the cantatas that we're doing, but also like the SDG at the end of every manuscript and, you know, this like, he was clearly a very devout person who like was creating his craft for a larger purpose than mm -hmm. himself. Not to say he didn't have an ego, but which we don't actually know, right? <laughs> um, but it's interesting, there's no room for us to bring that kind of vanity into it, I find. And when I see that, it often manifests itself, I think, as, um, at least to me, as sort of ill-preparedness. <laughs> so I'm like, hmm, that was cocky of you. Way to, way to show up and not really know it, you know? <laughs> so I, th I think that we've, we've talked a fair amount already about questions of faith and religion. Um, I, I think that it's still one of the things that hangs in the air. You know, all three of us have, have had um, very profound experiences with questions about the St. John Passion, for instance. You know, um, should it be performed? How, how can we present a piece that contains language wherever that language lives in the piece and where it was drawn from, it's still there that can be seen as promoting a, an anti-Semitic point of view um, that is, is depicting a group of people, a, 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 a race you could say, but certainly a faith tradition that in, in an extremely negative light, in the most negative of lights, this group of people killed my God, <laughs> right? Um, and so I think that you know, we, we can never escape some of the most difficult questions that Bach is going to pose to us, and, and not in this sort of benevolent, genius way that he was posing, you know, like, can you do it and all that stuff. But, but you know, how do we deal with those questions? You know, could this be the ultimate Bach can't be for everyone because he's, he's offensive? Right, he's 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 promoting a, a, a very narrow parochial worldview that excludes people. Is he promoting it though? Again, or is it the author of the Saint John Gospel? 
<laughs> I mean, he was locked into some source material there. And also, he screwed with it, like, <laughs> to an extraordinary degree in the case of the John. So I don't, I, like, I mean, was he anti-Semitic? We have no idea. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, like, it's not unreasonable to assume that he held some anti-Semitic beliefs because of where he was, the time in which he lived, the community in which he lived, the faith he practiced. Mm -hmm. But that said, you know, there are other settings of the John Passion that are, they don't futz with the source material, that are way more anti-Semitic sounding. And the John, the, like, the John Gospel is, like, there's an agenda there. The agenda is to other those people and draw a distinction. And so inherently, there is this anti-Semitic, at least for me, agenda built, baked into the source material. And I, for me, that's really the question. Like, we don't really know in terms yeah. of him. And in terms of, if anything, if we centered the music in that, at, at the core of that conversation, I don't see it necessarily. I see the John Passion as someone who is very keenly aware of the, the history that it was a community of people that scapegoated their own and he identifies with that community. Mm -hmm. I don't see it and it's othering it. And I see his insistence on keeping the Peter weeping at the end of mm. part one, right before Achman Zinn, and um, the cock Which crowing and all that. Which is not That's not from the John, it's that's from, from Matthew. Matthew. Yes. His insistence on inserting the, those aspects of the narrative in there to me point at something where he's really trying to underline different themes in that story for me. And I think the fact that it sparks that conversation is the reason maybe why we should be doing it. I love that mm -hmm. answer. Like, yes. I'm not saying that my opinion here is right, but like, those are points that are worthy of discussion. Yeah. And if there's that much worthy of discussion, whereas like, I don't know, the, like, you know, other passions, John Passion settings, like, they don't really raise those questions. And so therefore, maybe it's not as compelling to perform them, I, you know? And I will say, I didn't, didn't anticipate this is where the conversation was going to go, but it has. Uh, <laughs> so, but I think to your point, he was, his hands were somewhat tied by the source material. Um, and what we do know is the material he did choose and where he, as you say, messed with the gospel and added, I think there are two or three spots where he borrows from the St. Matthew gospel mm -hmm. and brings a sense of humanity into it that is not present in the John gospel. And the other thing is the Madrigalian text that he chose, the free poetry, I think tells us a lot more about his point of view than the source material that he had no, that he did not choose himself. I want to tell an anecdote that I think is going to illuminate this. It's, it's not about the John gospel, but or the or the the passion. The the September of two thousand and one. Hmm. <laughs> Emmanuel Music was involved in a very um, intense recording project. We were recording the cantatas for the first and second Sundays after Trinity, um, as hope was hoped to be a part of a much bigger series of cantata performances. And in order to do that, we were also programming those same pieces in the church services. The cantata that was scheduled for September 15th, September 16th, the weekend after September 11th, was um, cantata 76. Um, and Ryan and I both have very personal. We were the, yes, yes. We were not only there, but we were the, the, the two singers of the two arias I'm about to talk about. So in this marvelous work, which is Die Himmel at Salen, and so you know, it starts with, oh, the heavens are telling, almost like we're thinking of Haydn's creation. Um, the cantata, which is a long piece that has two parts to it, um, it really goes in a lot of different places. And at the beginning of the second half of the cantata, there's a tenor aria <laughs> that is really rather rabidly vicious in its musical setting and also its text. And it talks about, uh, basically says, hate, hate me, enemy race. Go ahead and hate me. Uh, this, this sense that we see in Bach um, rather often 
of, of, of a sense of, of a faithful person being persecuted by the world or persecuted by people who do not share the proper beliefs. And it is actually followed by one of the most strikingly loving pieces, which is an alto aria that says, show love in your deeds, Christians. So right there in this moment of this cantata, you have this juxtaposition. So obviously, after September 11th, everyone is thinking, what can I do? What, 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 is, what, what can we do, right? And there's a church service, and um, you know, should we change our programming? And, and there was a lot of pushback mm -hmm. against having that aria about sort of the, the most vile kind of othering of someone and, and sort of a mutual hatred being sort of stretched out into different poles. Um, and I remember the, the shock even of, of thinking, of hearing that in the face of what we had just experienced, you know, as a world and as a nation, and even as a city, because Boston, having two of the planes taking off from Logan, we felt very personally involved. Um, Craig, for his reasons, was very insistent not to change it. And, and the best part of his motivation not to change it was one of the greatest things about him as a musical leader, which was that he understood that we have to grapple with the most difficult questions at the times when we need them the most. What I remember taking away, of course I was lucky, I got to sing the loving piece, so <laughs> that was, I got the easy job. But what I remember was, it was so important to hear that sound, the hatred, because it was one of the possible emotions that we were feeling. And it was possibly one of the emotions that had been projected upon us as, as Americans, right? And that's something that Bach can do. He can show us the ugly side. I mean, he's sort of distressingly good at doing that. Um, and it's a thing about Bach that many people are very, very uncomfortable with because they want to go to him to be comforted. And they want to go to him to be inspired for the good stuff, right? But I think really one of those aspects of what makes Bach such a mirror of the human condition, and this is where it comes back to the St. John Passion, is that he will hold up a mirror to the ugliest parts of ourselves, and he says, that's you. The person singing that ugly, you know, snarly, teeth-bearing aria, that guy over there, <laughs> mm, <wasn't he? laughs> um, is the same person who sings the other aria and they have to be reconciled. It was crazy that that was the lesson I took away from 9-11, you know, but it was really profound. If and only more people had taken that lesson from 9-11. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when I hear the, the turbo choruses in the John Passion, I can imagine that he's thinking of another, but I also think he knows that that aspect is in every one of us. And we can so easily turn to be the person who says, oh yeah, you know that guy we thought was so great? No, he's not. He's, he, we have to destroy him. Well, and in the, in the St. John Passion, that one of those corrals that turns the mirror right back at you, it was I, I am the one who's responsible for this. Right. So, I, I don't know, we, we have uh, not, a, not a hard stop. Mm -hmm. um, we may have reached a, a point <laughs> at which, no at which it might be good to invite some more voices into mm -hmm. our conversation. Sure. So um, I think we're going to set up a, a microphone that will just make it easier for those of us in the room to hear questions, but also 
for those of you watching on the live stream to also be able to participate in hearing what's being asked. So as I said, I'd love to invite our fellows to, to share their thoughts. Grant, do you want to? Sure. <laughs> um, so my, my question uh, relates to something that we brought up earlier in the conversation. Uh, Pam, you mentioned something about music in German kind of being a barrier to, to the audience. Not necessarily in Boston, but in other areas. So I suppose my question is, um, and I'd like to hear from all of you, is what are your thoughts on performing Bach in English or whatever the languages of the area? And do you feel that, is there something that gets lost in translation? I mean, I, for me, I guess the question is not in terms of like, prosody or like word stress on certain syllables, but is there is there a je ne sais quoi to the, or I guess an ich weiß nicht, <laughs> to, to the German language specifically in Bach, all the ichs and achs and like, do what do you feel the flavor of German adds to the music? So it's funny you ask that question because my manager called today and was asking me about a potential Matthew Passion. I said the, the first thing I said to her was, can you please make sure that they're doing it in German? Because I have no interest in doing it in English. <laughs> <laughs> but I will own that that's a personal preference for me as the performer. Like I have no desire to sing a Matthew Evangelist in English or any of the things that you guys are working on this week in English. But I think as, I think I know people who do that and um, I understand that their reasoning is because they want the immediacy of the text. They don't want that barrier. Right. And I guess I can appreciate that. Um, but my personal preference is that I just think so much of what he did is so word specific. So often, not just prosody, but like the word painting, that I don't know, it just kind of loses something for me because you can't ever, you always lose something in translation. And I mean, you're a master translator. <laughs> and it's amazing how you keep, like that's hard work, keeping the whole, you know, beauty and meaning, like all the layers of meaning, as many as, as you can in a translation. But you inherently lose some. And so for singing in the moment where we experience it in that moment, I just personally, I don't, it, it feels uncomfortable as a performer. And then I think, I believe this as, an, as for the, in terms of the audience. I think in a way it makes our jobs harder because I think we need to always perform as if we're singing in a foreign language and people don't have translations. Because half the time, they don't. <laughs> half the time, they're like the parishioner who stuck back, snuck back in the back mm -hmm. with, with no bulletin. Or you show up and you give a recital and the presenter forgot to print the things. And so I just think <clears throat> that's part of the power of the music is to be able to transcend that barrier. And I think we can trust that a little bit more. But that is very personal, and I know that mm -hmm. there are a lot of varieties of opinion about it, and I respect those other opinions very much. Do you have a... Oh, I go back and forth on this. I remember there was an era at Emmanuel where our principal guest, conductor John Harbison, had done a number of his own English translations of cantatas, um, specifically some of the Weimar cantatas that were Salomo Franck texts. Yeah. And while there was an immediacy, I do believe, to our congregation in terms of hearing it in the vernacular, um, and John, one of his many skills is actually, as a lyricist, I think did a really quite admirable job. I do believe there was a lot lost in terms of the, there's more, the color of the language, the, the rhyme, the, there's so much that is inherent in the language, and I tend to agree with you. Um, having said that, I think there's value in doing things in the vernacular. We just did a concert back on December 17th with the final chorale to Bach. We sang it in German and then we repeated it a second time in English and had the complete audience, all the audience sing along. An idea I was very resistant to, but was convinced by some of my colleagues. And I, I will tell you as a conductor, when I turned around in an audience of 400 people, plus all the musicians behind me, and the Boston Children's Chorus and Cambridge Common Voices all singing together in unison a Bach chorale in English was 
far more moving than I ever would have anticipated it being. Um, and I also think about, I mean, part of the Protestant Reformation was about doing liturgy in the vernacular. So I guess I'm making a case for both. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, think, I think I share both sentiments. Um, thank you for your compliment. But one thing that I really have never really tried to do is, is create a translation for singing. Mm -hmm. um, and so my, my work in translation is so very specifically not that. Um, and I believe that the skills that are needed, as, as you referred to as you know, John's lyric, lyricist mm -hmm. talent, um, it, it's, a, it's a different set of skills. Um, however, I, I share John's impetus that it's wonderful to see how people react differently when you're hearing your own native language being sung. I think it's something that needs to be tried more but I do think that things are lost, things that are tangible and things that are intangible, right? I um, sat on a panel with John. We had done Cantata 9 um, with his translation. And he, he was talking about a certain set of images that he used for the tenor aria. And I said, but we're missing the vowel on Verschwunken. And you know, yes. and I, and I was like, I was like there's just, there's, there's, the sound of the words is just helping everything else. And, and he was really not happy that I was pushing back <laughs> against him at that moment because um, you know, he, he knew that that was just something he had to sacrifice as he was creating the other elements that he wanted to get into that text. So um, I think I will say this, that I think that the feeling all three of us are showing that we, we love the sound of the pieces with its original language. It's a, it's a touch elitist. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to own that. That's it's our perspective is, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> we're very privileged to like know the German, and so. Right. But I, I think the question <laughs> needs to continue to be yeah. asked: Why isn't it being sung in English? Can we hear it in English? What what's going to happen to the music if you sing it in English? Well, we know it's not going to get destroyed. That's that's for it's, sure. It won't get destroyed. It's but resilient. Something is. <laughs> but, something yeah. Is thank lost. you for that question. Thank you. Great. Uh, um, well, do we have any other fellows that have questions? I think I yeah. do. I apologize. Um, mine's more of a, I, I suppose, like a simplistic, um, there are no philosophic. Simplistic, uh, <laughs> simplistic and philosophic. But, um, Ryan, you had talked about a story with um, one of the, the, what was it, a, part, a person, a part of the board, mm -hmm. a story of a person, a part of the board, and they didn't want to have the lyrics. Um, or the text to to one of the cantatas that you were doing, and I guess my question is, is like how, as artists from the from the performer side, from the, the musician side, do we make this music human? Is it more due to us creating these musical connections between us in the ensemble, or in the music, or in the in the choir, or any sense, or do we allow for the music to bind us? That might sound mm. very... That you know, is I such think, a simplistic question. Yeah, I, I cannot yeah. believe you asked such a question. Well, I'm scared. I'm Where's sorry. the simple part? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not, you're kind of asking a chicken or egg question, right? I suppose, and yeah. like, I, 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 I think about this a lot, actually, because you know, I know I have colleagues who play this music who don't speak a lick of German. They don't care about the German. Like, <laughs> but they have this kind of... And I think this is where like talent comes in. Like, They have a natural talent for... like following the roadmap that Bach gave them. And they had approach it with a sense of imagination. And Bach, in the sense, has done the work for you, right? Like, there, it's like reading a script and not knowing exactly what it means, but you follow the directions. And some people are great at that. Other people are not. Like, they need, you know, a Cliss Notes, or what is it? There's, it's not Cliss Notes anymore. There's something else now. I'm dating myself. But you know what I mean? Like, you, mm. you, they need a guide. They need, like, you know, a Rick Steves to like, you know, help like guide you through things. I dated myself even more. <laughs> so, I, and I think that's where the text comes in handy. You know, it's, um, it's interesting as a singer, for instance, like, you know, I'm dealing with text all the time, like we all are. And I, was, I used to love math class because there was a right answer. And like, I knew how well I did on my test. 
English was not necessarily my favorite because like, what does it mean? Especially poetry, like, oh my God, what does it mean? <laughs> what I love about the, being a musician is that I get this cheat sheet for at least an interpretation. And so, you know, I feel like they inform each other and I feel like a little bit, I mean, again, it's like both sides to your question, but like, I feel like both can be helpful, but I don't know that either is necessary, if it makes any sense, like as long as you've got one or the other. What I'm thinking of when you ask this question is another, uh, I don't know what we would call them, Dalalisms, maybe? <laughs> oh, uh, no. One of these things that I'm always saying about Bach, which is that when we look at the text and we study the music, we don't always see a one-to-one -one correspondence in what the text is saying and what the music is actually portraying. Um, in fact, sometimes it can almost be contradicting. Um, a piece that, that claims that you know, the, the, the protagonist, the person speaking, is, is you know, completely ready for death, and the music is crying out in agony you know, with, with tortured intervals and, and um, just stretched out sort of harmonies that surprisingly shift and things like that. And you know, for me to, to take what is there as literally as possible, you have to say, I think I'm supposed to believe this, but I'm not there yet, I'm not ready, I can't quite face death or whatever the thing is. I, I, I've come around in so many ways on this question, not just with Bach, but in all music that I study, because obviously I love language and I'm fascinated by in the interpretation of poetry and wanting to get to the meaning. But I think that ultimately we're musicians, so I think we must sing the music or play the music. So for an instrumentalist, I think we, we need to just keep asking the question, what, is, what am I hear? What, am, what emotion am I feeling? What character? And I think that if we are really good about that and really clear about that, that, that board member who comes and says, I just want to hear the music, we can be absolutely crystal clear in the message. The one thing they lose is, is there a contradiction? <laughs> is there mm. something that the text is saying that we just spoke directly from the heart of the music, but we don't know that, that what's going on in the aria is this sort of, um, we looked at something the other day where um, it seemed like, I'm, I'm so happy, I'm so eager, I can't wait to go to paradise, I can't wait to die, but the music is filled with agitation, you know, anxiety even. And we haven't really gotten to the heart of that piece yet, but I'm dying to get deeper into it because I'm thinking, where does this anxiety come from? It's not in the text. The text is, on the face of it, is telling us one thing, and then the music is clearly telling us something else. And they want to live together and that's where the human thing is. So I think that the, the one thing I absolutely believe as the, as the person who translates all these texts and sort of you know, seems to be the, the text guru is that we shouldn't believe the texts. We should listen to the music. Hmm. Interesting. It's funny too, the text often like when you approach it with your imagination too, I mean again this is like, like where do people's affinities lie in terms of are they text people, are they music people, et cetera, et cetera. And some people identify with one or the other. Some people identify with both, et cetera. Um, but I'm thinking actually about a rest that I saw being rehearsed earlier today with um, like the waves. My journey oh, is through waves. Yeah, I'm a child of sin. My journey is through waves of death. And it's like the text is very Sturm und Drang like, you know. But the opening two measures are like very like they're basic arpeggios of like a, a block harmony that is like extremely stable. And in a way to me, like that, that begs the question, like why did he write that? Mm -hmm. He could have written something like extraordinarily chromatic and tortured. That said, just because he wrote something that's very consonant sounding, like because of the text, does it need to sound so steady and stable? Maybe it's an invitation to like rock the boat a little bit more, <laughs> you know, it's, I think this is where, like, part of what, in the, the best composers, in particular Bach, I think, like, 
looking to the words opens up extra possibilities. You know? I, I, I'm just very curious, because you also mentioned talking about um, Yo-Yo Ma and his development of the, the Bach cello suites, and kind of just realizing even before then they were only really considered studies before public assaults brought them to life and performance and really finding emotions within that. So I guess that's where I was kind of getting at too, is kind of finding and bringing it to life in a sense of emotion versus context within the works. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, can I, I want to say something about that too. You, you, don't, you don't have to stand for it either. You can sit. <laughs> I, we keep going back to this idea of Bach being a resilient composer. But what I will say is that a lesser composer, I mean, I think, uh, let me go back. There's a very early cantata, cantata 54, Widerstehe doch der Stunde, which the text is just resist sin. I think it's don't let its poison bite you or seize you. Yeah. Yeah. And the opening is this five voice texture of two violins, two violas, and the continuo line. And it is achingly beautiful in direct opposition to the text. If you didn't know the text and you just listened to the opening 16 measure Ritonello, you could have your own imagination about what this piece of music meant. And it would stand on alone as a piece, as an incredible instrumental piece of music. You wouldn't have to know a thing about the text. You could, it could be your desert island piece, right? Mm -hmm. But I think the genius of Bach, and what engages me the most in Bach is that when I know that what Bach is actually doing is trying to present sin as the most beautiful, tempting, alluring thing out there, and that the, tech, the music is working in direct opposition to the text, that's a layer of intellectual and emotional engagement with the text that you don't find in another composer. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, because I think it can exist alone as a piece of music. And last year we had, a, or two years ago, a conversation with Simona Dinerstein about this. Yeah. And these um, parodies of Bach opening symphonias that turned into, or vice versa, I, I always forget well, it was, the direction. It was, it was an aria, a texted aria that turned into a harpsichord yeah, concerto. Yeah, that turned into a harpsichord concerto. And does she need to know the aria of the text to play this gorgeous middle movement of a concerto? And she said, no, it's an amazing piece of music. Why do I need to know this text? Mm -hmm. And of course, Pam and I thought, oh, but you're missing so much of it <laughs> because you don't know this, this text. Yeah, we tried to convince her. Um, of course, Wieder Stehe, Dr. Zinde is one of my favorite pieces. And what I discovered in singing it is, you know, when you read the text, it sounds like the preacher lecturing you. Let me tell you something. You got to resist this sin thing. You know, it's like hectoring you. But when you sing it in that context, you're talking to yourself. You're like, oh, oh, that feels good. Oh, I'm, oh, this is, oh, I'm really in trouble now because I don't think I can resist it, right? And then there's this amazing moment where you just sit on the pedal, on the tonic, and the entire orchestra plays the dominant. And you're just like this beacon, and it's almost like you're going to get, and of course, it, again, this thing with, holding the long note, you know, the, the, the athletic feat of is the singer going to run out of breath? Is the singer actually still even singing, right? Um, and you have to hang on because at the very end, you're not even done with the word, so you can't just stop singing. You have to have enough breath to come out the other side and finish the phrase. But that is like embodying the act of resisting the thing that just is so delicious and so tempting and so easy to fall into, right? And that's a much more profound way to tell somebody, don't do it, <laughs> than to just yell at them, right? <laughs> and I'll just say one more thing about that, which is I think seeing that in the music can transform an interpretation. Um, we have at Emmanuel a style of doing that piece in a very voluptuous way. <laughs> but 90% of the recordings you'll find when you go out are very harsh and fast and, and very bada, bada, bong, bong, mm -hmm. bada, right? Which, which does not help you hear the aspect of the piece that we just described. 
It's a different aspect. It's it's a very different aspect. Something that sounds initially like seductive snakes going like intertwining with each other suddenly sounds like whips being like right. But it also keeps the singer's voice more in the, right. in the sort of hectoring preacher like lecturing and less in that sort of this is my own personal experience that I'm maybe sharing with you cathartically. Right. Um, I always feel that box music is stronger when we allow ourselves to be the participant, the person who's, who's dealing with the very thing that we're talking about mm. instead of the objective preacher. And, and I think that aspect also is, is a really profound aspect of how Bach can be for everyone as opposed mm. to just telling us what to do. Yeah. I think Mia has a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to follow up on what you're saying about the occasional conflict that you find between the music and the text, and it made me start to wonder if maybe Bach's most human contribution or message is found in those paradoxical um, situations between music and the text. Because, for example, if you're talking about wanting to go to heaven, or I forget exactly what you're talking about with that one, but maybe that's Bach um, underscoring the doubt that probably exists in the minds of the faithful or with the sea journey, um, the anxiety of the journey itself. So I think maybe when, I was starting to wonder if you also agree that when the text conflicts with the music, if that's perhaps where the most universal message is, because I think then the beauty of the music and the sort of catharsis, I think Bach's music is full of drama. Um, I think maybe that's where we find relief from these emotions. So I think I was wondering if you might agree with that. Completely. I'll, I'll take it first, since I feel like you're asking me. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's where we really see Bach engaging our humanity. Mm -hmm. Because what he tells us in moments like that is, we're, we're flawed. We're imperfect. We're, we're, we're filled with conflict. We have, we have aspirations towards the good, but we keep choosing the bad, right? All these things that are commonplace in religious speech, but, but really transcend just religion that's really just the way we are as humans, right? And when we see him helping us see how hard it is, or the struggle that we have, and the, and the complexity of our thought and our, our contradictory thoughts, that's when I, I think, for me, that's when he's really speaking for everyone. So I totally agree with that. I guess then my follow-up is, are, are we really missing the essential element if we don't understand the text, if we intentionally ignore it, uh, do we miss the message that might be the most relatable of all? <laughs> I, I will have to agree with you. I think, I think that, that's sort of the follow-up exactly to Robert's question, which is that the music clearly has a voice that, that is, is saying, it's just desperately saying something all the time. And, and us as performers, we have to get all the cobwebs out and, and get rid of all the extraneous stuff and say the message, which we do through sound because we're musicians. Whether you're playing an instrument or whether you're singing, you're still saying the message through sound. But only when you know that you have this other layer of, I like to call it aspirational text setting because it's sort of like, I'm supposed to believe this. I'm supposed mm. to be thinking this. I'm just not quite there yet. Um, then I think we, we really feel that in a way that, again, I think very few other composers even attempt to do. So, all right. Anyone else? <laughs> Those can answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, Braden. somewhat unique thing in most of the ways I think people encounter Bach is through either a recording or a concert where you go and it's a thing and then you pay for it and you leave and that's a different setting than what than in a church and I was just wondering if you could speak to what you have learned, what you think is gained or lost like in doing it as part of a church service or regularly mm. on an ongoing basis as opposed to like in a concert setting. Mm. I, can I take this one? Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's yours, Ryan. <laughs> a lot of very strong emotions about this. It, uh, 
one of the, I, for me personally as a musician that is profoundly moving every week is the fact that we get to encounter this incredible music that really does, I think, represent the human struggle and the difficulties, not just, I mean, from a religious standpoint, one can say box music is as difficult as it is because it's, you know, reflecting the difficulty of a faith. And from a, in a broader standpoint, it's the difficulty of just living in this world and living with one another and being human and, and sometimes living with yourself, maybe even more so living with yourself, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Uh, um, but there's the incredible moment when the cantata is over and there's silence. And the feeling that I always have is that everyone, every cantata we've ever done is still in the air, hmm. uninterrupted by applause. And to me, that is not only as a musician, but a person of faith, too. But I find that incredibly moving. And the other part about it is that I feel like it's a space in which we don't have to get it right. We just have to do our best to untangle what Bach has given us and what the texts are. And I think that, um, you know, that speaks to something that you talked about, about the sort of vulnerability to run out of air, <laughs> to not have your best vocal day, um, to do a cantata on a Sunday morning when there's a snowstorm and you don't have all the instruments available to you. Um, I mean, there have been so many, but we still do it. Um, and the third thing I'll say is that... Um, I hope that's not a prediction. No, it's not. A, <laughs> oh, I shouldn't say that. Um, it took me a number of years to be convinced by many members of the board that we should do a cantata in concert. And it was for that very reason that I felt like, you know, we have something really special here. And that it's in the setting that it was meant for. I mean, it wasn't meant for an Anglican church in the 21st century, but it was meant for a sacred space. Um, so I resisted it for a long time, and I've come around to understanding the value of it, because it is, it is a point of entry for many people that wouldn't find their, their self in a worship service. And we're really glad that we're going to be able to share that experience with all of you. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was another question, Hope. Yes, I had more of a slide line. <laughs> but to give you a theme of time, if you could time travel back into Box Day and ask him one question about anything, what each of you guys ask? So I would opt not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you why. Um, one of the things that I love about him is that we don't know a ton about him. And they always say, be careful of meeting your heroes. Mm -hmm. And I'm really comfortable being in a space where I don't know much about him because it allows me to, I don't know, experience his music in a very um, neutral way. It's allowed me to do that, if that makes any sense. And it allows me to continue to let my imagination run wild with it. And I think that's really what he intended. In a way, he was, he had very strong opinions, that much we do know. <laughs> but, you know, he was also someone who was keenly aware of his own mortality. And I think he was also keenly aware that he was leaving something. I don't know that he would have imagined that we would review him in the way that we do. And I don't know that mm. he maybe even wanted that. But I do think he was, keenly aware of the fact that he was putting something down on paper and leaving it for other people to do what, with what they will with great respect. I mean, one of the things about, and again, I don't mean to like put the kibosh on your fun question because it is a fun question. Um, but one of the things I think that's really magical about music and unique about it as an art form is that it requires a living person to make it what it is. A composer is never really working in a vacuum because it's just notes on a page. We don't know what that sounds like. And it needs living people to breathe life into it. And I think that's so inherent in the art form that, I don't know, I mean, it's wonderful to be in dialogue with living composers when we are. But also, like, even, I mean, most of the composers I work with today, 
when I'm working on new commissions, they realize at a certain point, like they need to step, the best ones realize they need to step away from it. Mm -hmm. Like they, they don't want to be at every rehearsal. I mean, Jake Heggie, for instance, was talking to me the other day about, he's like, I don't need to be at every rehearsal. It's not good because it keeps me too close to the piece and the piece needs to have its own life. And you know, I'm, I've heard that from a number of composers. I'm sure John feels, Harbison feels similarly. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, so I don't know. I mean, so for me, like, just because of my unique, whatever, like our unique perspectives as performers, like for me, I don't know that I want to meet him. <laughs> I mean, I might be like, how'd you have so many kids? Like, <laughs> it would be like. Now there's a fun answer yeah. for you. It would be like a super obtuse question if I, had, if I was really gonna do it. That, <laughs> I wouldn't ask him a single question about his music because I agree with you. I, I don't, part of me wouldn't want to meet him either. But if I were to, I, I wouldn't ask about his music because I feel like the, one of the biggest gifts he's given us is that there isn't a roadmap. And we get to apply it to 2024 and to our lives now. And I, f I would be afraid if I asked him any type of musical question that guided our musical work, I I'd be afraid it would be limiting. Um, I would be curious about personal questions though, <laughs> about that. Did the, you know, you see these, um, payment logs of him getting paid in beer. You know, how much beer did you drink? Uh, <laughs> I'd ask him, would you have ever imagined in 2024 here in the 300th anniversary of the St. John Passion year and the Corral Cantata year that we'd still be talking about you? <laughs> yeah. And I'm gonna cop out too. I'm just really bad, but I, I, I say we, we, this came up in a conversation when I think about traveling back in past, I think about the music that we've lost. The, the mm. entire cycle of cantatas and you know, a, almost an, a, a, third, a, a fifth one that um, we'll never know. And, and some of those passions, the Luke oh, the and Luke, the Mark. Yeah. Um, the just unbelievable emptiness of knowing that potentially unbelievable music existed and we can never hear it, we can never reconstruct it. Um, so I guess my time travel would be a little after he was dead and, and maybe somehow to, to save and, and bring those pieces back because mm. um, that, you know, is a little heartbreak for me when I think about that, the fact that this prolific and, and spectacular composer Everything we know about him and all the music we know is is just so cherished and then this rather large body of work that we can document existed and it's gone. Mm. So. Thank you. Good question. Yeah. Um, any other questions from from any of our um, guest audience people? Any anyone? Um, I think. Pavel. Yes. Pavel. I have a question for Nicholas. I would like to thank you for your for your project um, on the, uh, episode three. Oh, I, I thank hope, you. I hope to stick around and uh, with you. <laughs> and uh, I have two slightly related uh, questions. Uh, so you, the question you are addressing head on like, you know, is is this music for everyone? Uh, I from the experience or from observing the world, world uh, I feel like there are few, but there are many places where Bach is a niche interest, and then there are very few places where Bach is more mainstream, mainstream interest. Mm. And here for a, so one question for a selfish reason, we are here on the territory of the manual music, what can uh, the places where where Bach is a mainstream interest teach to places where Bach is is still a niche. And one one example that comes comes to my mind is uh, or the, the society is the the, the Netherlands, uh, where uh, 
historical, yeah, it may be related to linguistically, you know, geographically, but uh, historically for centuries the dominant religion wasn't Lutheranism, it was Reformed or Calvinist tradition, which is can, can be quite different, probably. And, uh, and you got part of the country that are more Roman Catholic. So, uh, you know, what, in your experience in, in working around the world, uh, what what is special about the, those places where Bach is for for more people? And, and the related question is from a different field of art. Sometimes a set of Bach cantatas is compared to a set of uh, all plays by Shakespeare, <laughs> which coincidentally have some of the similar issues <laughs> that Bach cantatas yeah. texts have. And uh, it, at least since I'm not a literature, English scholar, literature, scholar, drama scholar, but it seems to me that uh, Shakespeare speaks to a wide range of cultures, backgrounds, languages, whether it's, of course, it's performed in translations for non-English speakers. Uh, so is there something that we can take from how Shakespeare speaks to the world and the world and how the world takes Shakespeare? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your, well, thanks for watching Bach 52. <laughs> um, and thanks for the questions. You know, it's, um, the Netherlands is an interesting example of a place where, I mean, you know, there's a deep, deep, deep tradition of Bach and it is extremely mainstream. It's not a niche thing and it's, it's not necessarily where you'd expect it to be, right? Um, I just did Matthew Passions with Jap van Sweden in both New York and in Hong Kong. And it's really interesting doing it with him because I didn't really know what to expect. And, you know, he has, it was evident immediately that he has a lifetime of experience with this music because he grew up playing Matthew Passion every year, multiple times a year. And it's a part of his bones and his like DNA that it's not for, you know, people who didn't have that lifetime experience with it. I think in some places, where it's not niche, like it is, it's part, it's embraced as part of the cultural consciousness, like in Germany and in the Netherlands and in German speaking countries um, and in Scandinavia. But I also think about places like, um, actually, I, you know, I come back constantly to Helmut Rilling, and that's partly because of my experience. And yes, he's, you know, a German theologian, musician, so. There's a natural draw for him there. But there was something about what he has done over the course of his lifetime where he has developed, he sort of takes in an evangelical approach to Bach that I really admire. And he goes somewhere like Eugene, Oregon, which, I mean, no disrespect to Eugene, but like, what is in Eugene, Oregon? <laughs> Nike. Like, you know, like, and a, and, a, and a pretty decent university. Um, but like, it's, it's not like the most culturally diverse place. It is not a place I would expect to go for like, you know, I can't, I, it was a, it's a shock in a way that there's a Bach festival there. But you know, there was a person there who was really taken up by Helmut and brought him out there. And for 45 years, they built this extraordinary thing where people would flock from all over the world to come see it. And then conversely, I think about what he was doing in Germany and you know, my experiences with him there were there were people coming from South America, Asia, Northern Africa, you know, all over the world to work with him on this music and it's because they were so compelled by it. And I mean, people of all ages, you know, 18 to 80, like just living in this music and I think the lesson that we take from that is that that was someone, or that is someone, who is keenly aware of his responsibility to the music. It's, it's not just to perform it well, but it's also to create accessibility around it. I mean, he made it accessible to, he makes it accessible to anybody. He will sit down with you and take you through a score 
you know, and happily for hours. And he would do that, and he he created these programs to that that you know you think like a lecture recital, like who is going to go to that? Sold out, and it's because the way he would talk about it was so compelling, and he was inviting people to get to know this music. And I think, I think, as especially as classical musicians, we are not trained to do that. We're trained to respect what's on the page and do our best to give the best, most perfect performance of it. And we take for granted that people know what it is because we spend our lives <laughs> living in it. But I think we always need to be aware that it's new music or it feels like new music to a lot of people. And it's our responsibility to, even though we do have the privilege of being elite and erudite, <laughs> um, to strip away those things not that we need to condescend or, or anything, but in, in, on the contrary, invite people to be in dialogue with it. And that's something that I think he did that I think was really, really inspiring. Um, you know, and I think about the Netherlands, you mentioned that, like, there's the All Bach project where they're filming all the cantatas, and like, that is like a really interactive project where they're building a resource that is for the world. I mean, that is the mission behind that project, is to build a resource that is accessible to everybody. And so I think that's a really key thing in terms of kind of making it feel less niche, you know? I think that's part of the reason why this community here in Boston is one of those places like the Netherlands and Eugene, Oregon and Leipzig and Weimar where it's not so niche. There's a real audience for it here and a real following and it's because there's a community that's engaging with it in this way that is about trying to invite people into it, which I think is beautiful. Um, so that's the first part of your question. The second, Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Interesting you say that, because where I'm staying, I'm in the midst of programming a song festival about Shakespeare, so he's been on my mind lately. Um, and I just, it ha there happens to be in the room where I'm staying a copy of Harold Bloom's book on Shakespeare, the, the last one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just pick up the dust jacket and it tells you in the little blurb, like, Shakespeare is the person who invented what it is to be human in terms of our modern conception of it. I'm like, that's a bit of a bold statement. He was <laughs> not alone. But this idea that you have, b the assertion on the dust jacket of that book says, before Shakespeare you have characterization and after Shakespeare you have characters. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a similarity there in the sense that we like before Bach you have a certain kind of music and after Bach you have a different kind of music that whether he likes it or not leads to the romantic period and, th and beyond. And I think that is one of the ways in which I think we should continue to engage with it in order to, to ensure its appeal because its appeal is not insured. I mean, we have to, we have to continue to work at that. Um, and I think the things that Pam was talking about earlier in terms of like the humanity that Bach invites, I mean, at, for his time, Bach was regressive because he was, in, like the enlightenment was coming along. I mean, there's this wonderful story about musical offering where he goes to the court of Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great's like, I'm gonna one-up your dad to his son who's this court musician and he, you know, says, invite your, invite your father, and I'm gonna have him write a fugue on this impossible subject. And, you know, the idea behind that is like, the fugue during Bach's time is the most revered, elevated form of composition. It's supposed to represent the pinnacle. And in the period in which we're moving towards Frederick the Great's new ways are really moving away from that. He's trying to make fun of the fugue. But in response, Bach writes musical offering as, you know, which is an offering, but it's also like a giant middle finger to <laughs> Frederick the Great. And one of the things that I think he's really grappling with is this idea that there are no easy answers, that he's asking us to hold these multiple truths. And in a way, like even though that was regressive then, that's progressive now. You know, I heard, um, I don't know if anybody listens to New Yorker Radio Hour. Hmm. But there was a panel of historians, they were talking about 
our current state of affairs, which, you know, there's lots of fodder for discussion. And Jill Lepore was, was talking, and she said, you know, she had written her book, These Truths. And she, it was about American history. And she, when she wrote it and was sent it off to the publisher, she ended with Barack Obama being elected to the presidency. And so, in essence, her book was about Barack Obama being like the story that led us to the, about Barack Obama's presidency. You know, 10 days later, Donald Trump is elected president, so she has to write a hasty, like, final chapter to the book that acknowledges that. And so then the book gets published, and everybody says, oh my gosh, how did you know? How did you write this book so quickly about how we got to this place? <laughs> and she said, you know, in doing that, she saw that, like, there are multiple narratives that we have to hold. And our instinct in this time, and what causes so much tension for us, is that we tell ourselves these re reductive versions of history and these reductive narratives that kind of hold one truth or hold another truth. But if that's the case, then neither truth is true. And at the same time, both are true. And really the way forward is acknowledging and the ability to be able to being able to hold both of those truths so that we're not throwing out babies with the bathwater, so to speak, and able to kind of move forward in a way. So in a way, I feel like if we can engage with Bach on these levels, like Harold Bloom is engaging with Shakespeare and humanity, I think those are the ways to kind of, I don't know, make sure he's still in our minds. And I think that's probably good for society, not in the sense that it's like good fiber and like classical music is good for you, but that we're being asked to think about our humanity and where it's directed and who we are in the face of those challenges. Sorry. That's all right. I think <laughs> on that note, um, we have had a really long and stimulating evening and fantastic questions. Thank you so much. And thank you, Nick. Thank you. And thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Pamela. And I hope that you will join us for more of our events. We have open rehearsal tomorrow, a discussion of Cantata uh, B2V7, um, Kristen Zerherz from Jordankam. And then on Monday night, we're our fellows, all of our fellows will be performing in a public masterclass that Nick will be um, t leading. So it'll be a fantastic opportunity to see us putting the work together in the midst of it. So we're really excited to present that. And then some more public lectures later in the week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.